buried in all that verbiage, what Dr. Sundar is saying is, free fall for the 18 stories under consideration would have taken 3.9 seconds. However, their computer model simulating collapse required 5.4 seconds. The slower collapse time was to be expected since there was structure supporting the building as it fell, slowing the fall. But there was a progression of failures that had to take place and that these were not instantaneous. All of this makes sense as long as you don't look at the evidence. <laughs> the evidence shows that free fall actually occurred. But since their computer modeling could not come up with a scenario that would allow for free fall, they had to declare free fall out of bounds and try to cover up the evidence. The problem is, unlike the columns and girders buried deep inside the building, the motion of the building is right out in plain view. Since their model predicted 5.4 seconds for the 18-story collapse, they dutifully conjured up a 5.4 second measurement to match. They had to stretch themselves to do it, but they did it. They found the disappearance time, then they went out of their way to pick an artificially early start time, exactly 5.4 seconds earlier. This they compared with free fall time. This next question comes from Dr. Stephen Jones. Uh, this discusses the fall time for WTC7 on page 40 of the summary report, where uh, it stated, assuming that the descent speed was approximately constant. However, observations uh, by others of the descent speed show that the building is accelerating uh, rather than uh, being at constant speed. Uh, so the question is, why did NIST assume that the descent speed was approximately constant? Stephen Jones was calling attention to the obviously erroneous claim on page 40 of the draft report that stated that the building descended at constant speed. I'm sure constant speed was a simple misstatement. The correct response should have been, whoops, we'll fix that. But no, here's how they handled that question. Force of gravity obviously is, uh, uh, the acceleration of gravity is uh, what's uh, at the driving force and uh, uh, our calculation was uh, based on the amount of time from the uh, top of the parapet uh, to fall till it uh, disappeared from view between the two buildings uh, seen in the uh, video. Uh, that uh, uh, time was uh, established from the uh, uh, video uh, by a single frame. Um, um, search of the of the uh, time, so that was down to one thirtieth of a second. Um, and then we did the same thing for when the top of the parapet uh, disappeared. Uh, we found that um, that time to be uh, 5.4 seconds. I didn't hear a whoops in there, did you? This is John Gross, one of the lead engineers for the NIST report on the collapse of the Twin Towers. He has a PhD in structural engineering from Cornell University. He taught engineering at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He has a long resume on top of that. Don't you think he probably knows the difference between speed and acceleration? Don't you think he could explain it with perfect clarity if he wasn't so preoccupied trying to cover his tracks? Don't you find it interesting that the 5.4 seconds he measured for the collapse time just happens to exactly match the theoretical prediction of their model? That kind of precision is incredibly rare when modeling real-world events. Incredible is the right word. It's not credible. This measurement has all the characteristics of what we call dry labbing, manipulating the data to fit a predetermined outcome. It's an ethics violation in science on a par with plagiarism. Any engineers engaging in this kind of sleight of hand should lose their licenses. The larger implication, of course, is dry labbing in this kind of investigation would constitute a criminal cover-up. After another round of quibbling, someone had to step in and bail out poor John. Can you clarify that? Uh, I think it's uh, something that we need to clarify and collect in the final version of the report. Okay. That was August. This is November. The final version of the NIST WTC7 report just came out. And guess what? We have a revised analysis of the building collapse rate. Constant speed is out. Constant acceleration is out. Instead, we have three phases of collapse, with a whopping 2.25 seconds of absolute freefall. The irrelevant 5.4 seconds is still defended in the wording, but it plays no apparent role other than CYA for John Gross and Associates. 
So free fall is hereby official dogma. How are they going to handle all the ramifications of that inconvenient fact? Read on. It says, The three stages of collapse progression described above are consistent with the results of the global collapse analysis discussed in Chapter 12 of NIST's NC Star 1-9. That's it. Freefall went from an impossibility that required backflips and logic to obfuscate to a simple fact to be measured, then declared consistent with their fire-induced collapse hypothesis. Apparently, they have now decided that freefall is okay as long as it is seen as a part of a longer stretch of time that covers the required 5.4 seconds. In other words, they dropped the bullying tactic of blowing smoke to obscure the facts and adopted an alternate bullying tactic, cover it with a lie and walk away. However, NIST cannot walk away from freefall. Now that NIST has certified freefall as fact, take a look at the implications. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> huh? <clears throat> okay. Um, I, I was actually going to do a two-part thing. For the second part... Excuse me. Yes. Is it back here. I know the answer, but how many uh, how many buildings have actually collapsed uh, oh. due to fire? Uh, you, you're talking about okay. If you phrase it, how many steel frame buildings have collapsed due to fire? Completely due to fire. Three. All on 9/11, <laughs> according to their story, and that's it. There are no steel frame buildings. There was a, in fact, one of Bill Warner's friends who was at his little toy uh, event the other day, uh, was a, he said he was an engineer, he was in L.A., and there was, I'm not sure which building he referred to, but it was a large building. It burned for many hours. It was totally engulfed. It was just, excuse me? First interstate. Could well be. It was first interstate downtown L.A. But he was there, and he was actually involved with this somehow. And he said once the whole thing was put out, that it was totally destroyed, except they went through it, and they didn't have to touch a thing about the steel structure. They could rebuild right on what was there. Okay, so steel frame buildings, the structure uh, doesn't come down in fires. Uh, one of the things is the temperature of burning car um, carbon-based materials like paper and oil or even jet fuel, any of these, the temperature is well below... The, the temperature needed to melt uh, steel. And they quibble all over the place on melting it, weakening it, and stuff like this. But the fact is, experientially, even very severe blazing fires don't uh, cause global collapse like we're seeing here. Right. That's right. Well, no, th this, is covered, this was covered with a fireproofing material, and there was a lot of asbestos in it, which was one of the issues in this case. But, uh, excuse me? Yeah. 